Okay, so to continue with the, the pseudomonas uh, or the pseudomonads, uh, which is just basically a generalized group, you know, these are the oxidase positive um, non enterobacteraceae for the most part. That's a general um, description of this particular group. So we went through some of them already, and, and these are some more of them um, that we have to pay attention to. And just to remind you, these are for the most part environmental bugs, but as environmental bugs, they can be a significant problem in the laboratory. You are an accidental host for these organisms. You're not their natural host. That doesn't mean they can't do an awful lot of problems when, uh, uh, when they're with you. So one of the ones that we actually do have quite a bit of problems with, especially in the respiratory units, because it does actually um, uh, do a, a good job of surviving on uh, environment uh, fomites, environmental surfaces. Uh, it is still a water bug, but you know there's water everywhere. So um, a Cyndatobacter is one of those um, uh, groups that uh, one of those genus, sorry, that uh, oh, we hate to hear that the patient has it in particular in a respiratory site. Um, it is, these, remember, these uh, environmental bugs tend to be much more resistant to the antibiotics that we use for um, uh, other species, other uh, genus and species, um, and so they're a little bit more difficult to um, resolve. Um, and in certain patients, like CF patients, sometimes you can't get rid of them at all. Um, so Cyndatobacter has three main complexes that we find in uh, um, human infections and uh, they're they're so closely related and they share so many things in common that we do report them frequently as a uh, complex so for example I have written here uh, a Cynotobacter uh, baumannii uh, which is fine uh, but you'll frequently see that it's reported as a Cynotobacter calcolyticus uh, baumannii complex um, and this one is a non-hemolytic. You can see here on the plate, a Cynotobacter is a non-hemolytic. Uh, it's uh, glucose oxidizing, pardon me, uh, organism. And uh, again, this is just one uh, of the group. Then we have a Cynotobacter uh, loafi, uh, which is uh, also non-hemolytic. This one, uh, loafi is just a little bit different. It's glucose negative. But it, it's pretty much everything else looks the same. And then hemolyticus, oh, very easy to, to find this one because it's hemolytic, okay? So you have the three basic ones, Baumannii, uh, which is really Baumannii calcolyticus complex, uh, is glucose positive, Loafi is negative, glucose negative, and Acinetobacter is hemolytic, okay? Uh, and our biggest problem with these uh, is that they are colonizers. So our patients come in, they're on respiratory therapy, uh, and they end up with uh, um, a respiratory uh, acinetobacter pneumonia. Um, it's also easily spread uh, from person to person, um, so we, uh, especially through the, the, the respiratory therapy equipment. So they're very, very uh, sensitive to the presence of any of these organisms, but acinetobacter happens to be one that many hospitals have to uh, deal with. Now, you know, uh, and the other places in the hospitals that we have to worry about um, is the environment, uh, is, I'm sorry, the engineering stuff. It's in ventilators, it's in humidifiers, it can easily colonize catheters. Um, and part of this comes from uh, the fact that uh, these areas are uh, ideal for a Cynotobacter to live. It doesn't really need that much to live. But where does it come from? How does it get in the hospital? Well, again, it, this is a, an environmental bug. It's everywhere in the environment. It's in the soil. It's in the water. Um, it, it has been isolated from milk. It has been isolated from, uh, you know, frozen foods. Uh, it's 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 everywhere. Um, but when you are in an um, immunocompromised status, it's able to set up shop, um, and so it. it it frequently causes nosocomial infections, which you remember are those infections that you get when you're in the hospital. Um, they're environmental, uh, so uh, these are things you have to think of for patients who work in these areas in particular. So 
um, you know, a patient who has a wound, you know, maybe he's a, a the the patient is a, um, a I don't know, um, he, uh, you know, air, they puts in air conditioners or something like that, heating and air. Um, maybe he does that. Um, well, if he gets a wound at work, it is possible that the wound could be infected with a cinetobacter. Um, and a cinetobacter, if you are immunocompromised, it can spread to the blood. It's possible. And it does have this really um, great ability to live on fomites, okay, be spread by fomites. Um, if we um, test 25% of the adults, like 25% of you, 25% um, uh, of people will we will find skin colonization with the cinetobacter because you're always in contact with it because you're always in the environment okay so since uh, we know that then we know that the people who are visiting the hospital the people who work in the hospital the people who come to the hospital they bring a cinetobacter with them and then if we search even further, so on the skin is one thing, you know, we wash our hands, we clean ourselves, we should be okay. But then another 7% of adults actually carry the organism in their throat. Now that's not a normal place for a cinetobacter, um, but some people do become colonized. So the organism sets up shop and becomes part of your normal flora. You're not infected, you're colonized. Well, colonization is very difficult to... Uh, to deal with. You can't uh, use antibiotics to get rid of uh, colonization. Never works. They try it all the time. It never works. So how do we identify uh, a cinetobacter? Well, for the most part, most uh, experienced uh, microbiologists will notice it uh, right away. They'll look on the MAC and they have something that actually looks, uh, it's a non-lactose fermenter, but it kind of looks purple. It's not the normal pink that we see of a lactose fermenter. We immediately start thinking, oh, wait, that might be a cinetobacter. You do an oxidase, you're saying, wait, this is a non-lactose fermenter, because on the blood it really looks like a non-lactose fermenter. And you, you do an oxidase, you say, wait a minute, it's negative. Oh, maybe this really is a cinetobacter. So this is one of those pseudomonas, or the environmental organisms, that's not actually oxidase positive, it's oxidase negative. And that's important for you to remember, that's your clue for the identification of the non-fermenter, okay? Uh, it's also non-modal, um, so you, you know, whatever, you could put this on a wet prep or anything like that, and you won't see any uh, directional movement. And you can see, as I said, it has this uh, grayish purplish hue on uh, the uh, on the McConkie agar. On the gram stain, uh, a cinetobacter is a very short gram negative rod. It does resemble, you can see that it is a rod on this picture, um, but it does, uh, some people do report it as a cacobacilli, um, but it is definitely, it's very short, and so that's another one of our um, hints that this is uh, a cinetobacter, okay? So we, the, these are the things that we look, like, look for. Also, one of the things that will help keep it uh, away from um, Enterobacteraceae, um, you remember that uh, the entire family, pretty much, of it actually, of uh, Enterobacteraceae is nitrate positive. Well, a cinetobacter is nitrate negative, so that will immediately let you know um, that it is uh, uh, not, it doesn't belong in Enterobacteraceae, okay? Again, here's some more um, epidemiological uh, features that you need to be aware of. Who do we have to look for this in? Who, you know, who should we look for these cacobacilli, these oxidase negative cacobacilli in? The biggest thing for us are look at the units. Here's the units, okay, that we wanna look for. The ICUs are important, neonatal ICUs as well, and that's because they, they in, involve respiratory therapy. Burn units, because they're sitting in water all the time. They go in the burn tank uh, to get their, unfortunately, to get their skin, the dead skin removed. And, and when they're, you know, in contact with uh, water that much, you have that risk. And then you have to worry about uh, neurosurgery units because they're particularly immunocompromised. Uh, in a particular way, and then if a patient moves from unit to unit um, or gets one service after another on uh, the in the in the hospital, uh, we need to be careful of this. You also have to be careful of patients who have uh, indwelling catheters. Again, this loves loves a fomite, and one of the things that happens is 
they have um, an indwelling catheter in the process of cleaning themselves on a daily basis it will frequently get wet and that can start the process okay um, so we, we need to make sure that we keep an eye out for this guy and let them know as soon as possible that you think it is a Sinitobacter so that you can um, so that they can isolate the person and um, treat them quickly with the an proper antibiotics. And you can see here the fomites that are most um, uh, affected. Uh, okay, um, so these are all uh, little clues for you. Uh, so what kind of disease uh, does a Sinitobacter produce? Well, in, in a healthy individual, um, most uh, people are just become colonized uh, with the Acinetobacter. Um, but an interesting study uh, found that actually um, those 25% of patients who of, of adults, healthy adults, that we found who were um, colonized with Acinetobacter, they had a lower incidence of allergies. And so it's thought that Acinetobacter might be allergy protective. That's relatively new, um, but sounds okay. Um, and it's something that's being studied. I don't suggest that people go out and try and get colonized with the Um But it is uh, the, the in, in our world, in the hospital, um, uh, Baumannii is the second most commonly isolated non-fermenting bacterium in humans. Um, uh, but, and it's in, in immunocompromised individuals that a Sinitobacter can create these life-threatening infections. Okay, so your patient who's coming in to, you know, a, a, a clinic or something like that for a quick checkup, they're not really our high-risk patients, but your immuno, those who are really have some underlying disease, in particular a disease of the lung like asthma or something like that, you have to worry about them. And the, the problem is, not because it's necessarily so much more um, virulent than any other gram negative, but it's it's got very broad uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, a very uh, broad degree of it. Okay, so um, because of that, we want to try and protect our patients from this. Um, One of the things that's caused that we that we call when when a patient gets a nosocomial infection with a um, we call that uh, late onset ventilator associated pneumonia if they've been on a vent, um, and that is um, probably the primary um, disease that we that we deal with with the standard factor in the hospitals, but it is capable. Of produce so you've got the ventilator this is the number one ventilator associated but it is capable of producing skin and wound infections in particular in those burn patients and then it does have the ability to spread to back to, to the blood uh, luckily that's fairly rare and even rarer is meningitis okay it is very small so it can actually cross uh, the blood-brain barrier a little bit easier than some other organisms okay um, uh, for meningitis, uh, we the while Baumannii is our number one associated for pneumonia and the infections and the bacteremia, it's Lawafi that is actually most common if we find in, in meningitis of the cases of meningitis that we have. Okay, um, a couple of things that um, make Baumannii a, a bigger problem is that it is a um, it is able to survive uh, it dryness okay most bacteria can't survive dryness Baumannii can survive in a dry environment like on a dry surface you, you come in you clean the bed you you scrub the bud rails and you miss a spot it's able to survive there um, for even weeks up to weeks okay now an interesting aspect uh, for this particular organism uh, we saw um, since the start of the first Iraq war uh, we've had um, a, an, a large number of soldiers who have been infected with uh, Acinetobacter baumannii. And uh, what happened was, one of the things they noted was that there were civilians who were being treated at Walter Reed uh, Medical Center 
uh, in DC, you know, the um, VA there, um, and they contracted um, Bamani eye infections and died. And then at another um, military hospital in Germany called Landestuhl or something like that, I'm probably not saying that right, um, another civilian was under treatment and it was actually a German woman and she contracted uh, Bamani eye the, um, the same, she had the same Bamani eye. Um, and it's thought that this German, and she, unfortunately, she also passed away. So it's thought that they're not really sure um, exactly where the, um, where the, the originating um, isolate came from. But what they found is that the uh, soldiers who are passing through either of these hospitals, um, what was it, uh, either Walter Reed um, or Landestuhl, I, I'm probably not saying that right, but the one in Germany, um, they uh, remember what these kind of these kind of injuries that our soldiers are facing. They're they're facing burns, they're facing um, amputations. So you have exposed uh, tissues, and so as soon as your can take advantage of that, and because of the uh, association between. Um, a sinistabacter and the Iraq wall of the Iraq war, it became like a little, um, the, in the VA, it became known as Iraqi bacter, um, which is a little weird. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's just a little interesting thing. And it's something to watch out for. Soldiers who pass through these can become colonized. So we need to know um, where people have been um, in the past. And again, the resistance is our biggest problem. It's resistant to penicillin, chloramphenicol, the aminoglycosides. Um, it has certain strains have developed resistance to fluoroquinolones, which is our therapy of choice for this. So that's a problem. So we need to make sure that the doctors are using the right dosage and the patients are taking all of their meds. So um, here we have uh, the three different organisms. And we talked about them before. You have Baumannii, which is your uh, uh, glucose fermenter, uh, oxidase negative, um, Lawafii, uh, glucose non-fermenter, neither one of them is hemolytic, and then hemolyticus, which is actually hemolytic. Okay, so that's how can we can tell the difference, and you can see the beta hemolysis uh, right there. Okay. Um, the, uh, the term escape uh, is a class or a group, I should say, of pathogens. Um, that have been sort of grouped together. They're, they're not necessarily related to each other, um, but they have a high rate of antibiotic resistance and they are responsible for the majority of nosocomial infections. So what is the, and so a, a, a synergibacter is the A in escape. So what are the other ones? Just so you know, the E uh, is entero, uh, Enterococcus faecalis, uh, which we've talked about before. The S is Staph aureus. The K is Kleb pneumo. You can probably guess some of these. Here's your A for a Sinistobacter baumannii. The P is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the E is Enterobacter species, uh, another um, Enterobacter aceae. Okay, so because of its intrinsic resistance, there's uh, you know no chloramphenicol, no the aminoglycosides don't work, those kind of things. Um, it, it, it has been grouped in this escape um, group of pathogens. And so that means infection control is particularly looking out for these. Lawafii we see a lot less often, thankfully. Um, and hemolyticus the same, we see a lot left, less often. And one of the things you have to remember is that these are environmental bugs. So you have to remember um, if you see just a couple of colonies, it might just be contamination with environmental factors, okay? So that's important um, to remember um, as you uh, isolate these. Uh, and luckily, they both, um, uh, Luafii and Hemolyticus, uh, both um, are a little less uh, of a problem than Baumannii. Um, so here is how do I tell the difference the, between my two major um, 
isolates in this particular genus. And the key thing is, first of all, you have to be able to differentiate from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, the key thing there will be your oxidase. Your oxidase is going to be negative. Uh, but you could also use motility. Neither one of them is modal. Okay, so that should take you all of about three seconds to tell the difference between those. Also, your nitrate production is negative in uh, Acinetobacter. So, um, you know, in Pseudomonas, they're all, they're, all those things are positive. So that's how you would tell the difference between those. Um, but then now you know it's an Acinetobacter. How do you know which one it is? And you can see the key uh, test results here. Oops, my lines are just so not good. Um, you can see uh, it's your acids, um, which are the big thing. Glucose is, is your big one that's going to tell you the difference between the two of them. Um, but you can also use some of the other ones, xylose, and then go down galactose, mannose, raminose, all of those. Um, Baumannii can use a lot more sugars than uh, Loafii can. Okay, so that is uh, the helpful thing for, for to differentiate between these two. And now we go to a couple more um, organisms that um, we kind of group in this non-fermenter group. Or uh, they're not really all pseudomonads, but we kind of just group them all together as as these uh, um, oxidase positive non-fermenters. And you've heard of Moraxella before. Um, remember, we talked about Moraxella cateralis, but there are other members of the Moraxella group that are kind of belong a little bit uh, off to themselves. So cateralis is a, um, it, it can be a pathogen, and so we do have to worry about it. These ones are part of your normal flora. So um, they belong in your respiratory tract, okay? I mean, not in, in crazy amounts, but they're there. They live there, and they rarely cause disease, okay? Um, however, you still have to be able to identify them and remember, you have immunocompromised patients, which means that in some patients, even your normal flora can get into an area where it's not supposed to be, or it can uh, an environment can be produced where the, re the majority of the normal flora is uh, wiped out, and one of these isolates is able to sort of bloom and take over the area. That would cause an infection because your immune system doesn't just notice normal flora, it also notices normal ratios, right? So you should not have a ton of any of these in any one place. It should be living happily and coexisting with the rest of the flora, okay? So these ones, Marxella non-liquefications, non um, Marxella lucunata, and O. Solensis. Uh, these are, again, you would probably just ignore them if, they, if you found them in a sputum or in a throat in very small amounts. Uh, the most commonly isolated of this group is non-liquefications non because that's very hard to say for me. Um, and they can, it has been isolated rare cases of bacteremia and keratitis, which is just a skin infection. One of the things with Moraxella is pretty much all of Moraxella has an affinity for your eye. Um, so, you know, it's normal skin floor and normal throat. If you think about it, um, in particular in little kids, right? Um, so little kids are constantly putting their fingers in their mouth. And then what do they do? They rub their eyes as well. This is how the throat flora gets into the eye. And in the eye, which is sterile, the surface of your eye is sterile. Um, any organism will do pretty well. Moraxella happens to uh, be able to make that transfer pretty well. And Lacunata has, um, has been isolated from several cases of conjunctivitis, okay? Um, otherwise, if you saw these in small amounts, you'd ignore them, okay? You wouldn't, um, and that's kind of um, how no normal flora works. You need it to be, uh, at the right level, small amounts to in the rare to few um, range and um, ease nicely mixed with other organisms. You, if it's all by itself, you got to start being suspicious. Now, what are the characteristics of Moraxella species? You already know, we talked about this already, so you do know uh, some of this. You know that Moraxella is strongly oxidase positive, okay? And these are non-modal. These are tiny little um, 
gram negative uh, uh, cacobacilli to diplococci. It, you might get people um, call it either way, okay? Um, so they're really tiny and they're gram negative, okay? And as with cataralis, you remember cataralis, ah, they don't use carbohydrates. So their carbohydrate use inert, they don't do anything uh, with that, okay? Um, one of the things that points it out as Moraxella is the sensitivity to penicillin. Most non-fermenters are resistant to penicillin, but here you have Moraxella, uh, which are not. Um, some of them uh, may, well, some isolates, let's say, may or may not grow on McConkie, and that is down to the particular species and sometimes the individual isolate, okay? Um, it is also DNase negative. There is a Moraxella, which is DNase positive. Um, it's, it's very, it is so rarely isolated in humans. It's Moraxella canis, um, so it's not something that you have to go crazy worrying about. And you would be able to differentiate this from any of the Enterobacteraceae because it is nitrate negative, okay? Again, except for Canis, which we don't ever, almost never um, isolate. So now one of the things that can happen with Moraxella, any of them, is that Moraxella will easily grow in chocolate and it'll resemble um, Neisseria colonies, right? It is a small gray colony on chocolate, so is Neisseria, and it's strongly oxidase positive, so is Neisseria. And it's a really tiny gram negative um, cacobacilli to diplococci, so is Neisseria, okay? So you need to uh, remember that you, you can't call it Neisseria until you get to those carbohydrate <coughs> um, uh, tests because um, you got to keep more Excel in mind. And um, in the genital tract, uh, you know, Moraxella is normal. Some Neisseria is not so much, okay? So keep your eyes open. Make sure that you did that Thayer Martin to be able to rule out gonorrhea. Okay, so another um, non-fermenter group, um, that's what I'll, I'll call them, uh, another non-fermenter group that we have to um, uh uh, go over is alkaligenes uh, species. Um, and the, the major one that we have to deal with is um, alkaligenes faecalis, which used to be called alkaligenes uh, odorans, okay? And you might say to yourself, why do we have to know what the old name is? You have to know what an old name is because we have old doctors and they might remember and you have old microbiologists and they might remember the old name. So they, we like to make sure um, that uh, we keep printing the old name for, actually we do it for a number of years until people get used to the new name, okay? Um, and then we also have the CDC alkaligenes like group one. So that's, um, it is an isolate, but it has not been completely characterized yet um, by the taxonomists. Um, and these ones again, similar to a sinistrobacter, uh, alkaligenes causes nosocomial infections. In particular, it has been isolated in many um, uh, cases of septicemia, um, which actually arise from contaminated fluids, hemodialysis fluids or intravenous fluids. And in an in immunocompromised patient, even one or two bugs can lead to bacteremia, okay? If you're healthy, and you're getting dialysis. Okay, if, you, if you're on dialysis, you're automatically not completely healthy. But if you're as healthy as you can be on dialysis um, or receiving intravenous fluids, um, one or two bugs, your body will be able to take care of that, but not in an immunocompromised patient, okay? So that's important uh, to remember that we're always using and we're always cleaning everything um, and that we're um, allowing the alcohol or the... the um, Betadine allow it to dry. It does not work until it's dry. Okay. Um, the CDC alkaligenes like very rare isolates from clinical specimens, and eventually it will be assigned to a taxonomic group. Um, but we, you know, at this point, uh, it hasn't yet. Um, these isolates are both water uh, isolates. It's been isolated from tap water, swimming pools. Um, and unfortunately, things like dialysis fluid. So we need to make sure um, 
that we clean. The, another problem with alkaligenes is it's highly resistant to disinfectants uh, like chlorine um, or ammonia compounds. Many hospitals have included in their disinfecting protocols UV light so that th for these kind of bugs, which could be there, um, at least the UV light will prevent them from replicating. You might get a bug in you, but it won't be able to replicate. And so that would prevent um, the um, the infection. So, and for there are several non-fermenters that are resistant to disinfectants. And those are the ones we use. We use ones that have chlorine, in the, that have ammonia in them uh, in the hospital, not necessarily when the patient's in the room, but between patients so that we don't spread these bugs. Um, causes an opportunistic, remember you're not its natural host, so you, you get an, you're an accidental host, but it likes you, it'll do pretty well uh, in you. And we found it from ear infections, which is big from swimming pools. I always think about if they didn't have enough um, chlorine in the pool in an ear infection. UTI, almost always from uh, jacuzzis, you know, don't go in jacuzzis. Uh, wound infections, again, uh, it's a water bug. You have a wound. You go, you know, you clean it out with water, or you're walking through water with a wound. Uh, you end up with wound infections, and those can all uh, spread to inner organs like the lungs and uh, the blood. Okay. Um, uh, the most common species uh, for this one uh, is it can be isolated from the alimentary tract um, in between five and 19% of the normal population, um, but it still should not be in a predominating um, uh, ratio, okay? Um, luckily, systemic infection is very uncommon. We might get like an ear infection or something like that, but spread to the, you know, being able to spread to the entire, to the blood um, or even to the lungs. It, luckily, it is very uncommon and there's, uh, a, Good news for that because it does have a uh, pretty um, resistant uh, uh, bio antibiograms. Um, very difficult to get rid of this one if it makes it into a um, s systemic infection. Uh, one of the things that you can see, it is a relatively small uh, gram negative rod. Uh, over here, and you can see, I just wanted to show you this plate here of, of alkaligenes. It does look um, similar to a, a Pseudomonas, although a lot whiter, and you can see it's not completely beta hemolytic. So you can see here that it's not really beta hemolytic. Um, it has like a shiny uh, surface, um, and it's but and it's whiter than um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, but it does. It looks like a non-fermenter when it's growing there. Uh, then uh, how do we um, identify uh, alkaligenes? What are the characteristics? Well, first of all, um, this is a, a modal, a modal, a modal uh, organism. Uh, it is slightly, uh, it's, it's slender when you look at an gram stain. It can be slightly curved. Uh, it won't produce spores, so it's non-spore forming. And it actually, it kind of grows a little bit slow. You, on the first day of, um, on the first day of uh, growth, especially if the plates went in late and you're not actually looking at them at 24, you might be looking at them somewhere around, you know, uh, you know, 18 or 22 hours. It actually might be pretty small growth. It might take um, a little bit longer to get uh, uh, this kind of growth here. Okay, um, it is a non-fermenter. Um, it is uh, strongly oxidase, so you got modal, strongly oxidase positive, and it'll grow well uh, on most media. It'll grow fine on Mac, and it has a smell. Now, remember, we're not really supposed to smell. We're not supposed to teach you to smell um, plates, right? We don't want you sticking your nose in a plate. But when you first pick up a plate, especially if it's been in the incubator for hours, when you first pick up a plate and you open it, the volatile gases are going to be released and you're going to get a whiff. Okay, so alkaligenes does have a fruity smell close to apples. Okay, um, uh, so that's something that you should remember. And then uh, the resistance that we see um, 
alkaligenes are intrinsically resistant to the aminoglycosides. Um, the susceptibilities that we find um, uh, when we do the initial sensitivity, we usually find that initially the isolate will be sensitive to things like um, uh, piperacillin, carbenicillin, uh, um, um, sulfa trioxone, those things. Um, but what happens is, as you start to treat the patient, they quickly, quickly develop resistance, uh, including ESBL and carbapenem resistance. So the, when you're talking about alkaligenes, in order to successfully treat a, an immunocompromised patient, you kind of have to start it with a massive dose. And you have to do definitely more than one drug so that you can wipe these out as soon as possible. You don't want to slowly you know, pick up the drug, okay? Uh, so that's uh, important to remember about this um, genus. So if I have um, an isolate that I say, oh, I think it's in the alkaligenes group, how am I going to differentiate it between alkaligenes faecalis and CDC alkaligenes like group one? Um, well, the big things are, first of all, the nitrate is going to help you here. Um, uh, the nitrate for CDC is going to be gas uh, is positive, and, and you also see gas in the Durham tube from the same thing. Okay, um, so those are the two big ones that are going to help you to differentiate because alkaligenes is ne is negative for both of those. Okay, the variables are less helpful, although the, if you do get a positive urea, you know it's not fecalis, uh, um, and if you do get a positive cetramide, it is obviously not CDC group. Okay. Okay, then we go to the Acromobacter um, group, and uh, these are strict aerobes uh, found, again, in water, both freshwater and marine water, soil. Um, you know, they're out in the environment. So they have been identified um, as contaminants uh, on cultures. They're also contaminants in the lab itself. We've had, um, Acromobacter can be a problem in laboratory cell cultures. Now, we don't keep cell cultures in the micro lab, but sometimes our specimens go from the micro lab to the, um, to the virology lab where the cell cultures are. We don't want to send something that's going to mess up their cell cultures. And one of the things to remember in the microbiology lab, um, JCO, um, CAP, and all those places, one of the things that they restrict is um, you're not allowed to keep things in the micro lab like plants. And that's because, well, even though some people say, oh, I want a plant to liven up, you know, my environment, which is lovely, but it's not allowed in the micro lab. And that's because the plant comes with soil and the soil comes with these kind of guys. Okay. Um, as far as um, human isolates, Acromobacter has been uh, isolated from the only pretty much the uh, immunocompromised. That's pretty much it. Okay, uh, there have been reports of septicemia uh, in a patient with uh, a history of cancer, but no immunodeficiency, although that might be um, arguable. Okay, and previously, Acromobacter was uh, called alkaligenes. So you'll see here in my chart that I give you, I'm showing you how to differentiate the acromobacter from the alkaligenes. These all used to be alkaligenes, dentrificans, and so on down the line, okay? So um, when we talk about acromobacter, uh, our biggest thing are we're afraid of nosocomial outbreaks. So we do want to watch our... Um, you know, our, the fomites, the hospital equipment, everything from the respiratory um, equipment to uh, the bed rails, to the floors, to the, you know, faucets and all that stuff. Okay. The organisms, these organisms, uh, Pychowdii, xylosoxidans, and dentrificans, um, almost always um, uh, we see these in the immunosuppressed, um, but we do get nosocomial infections of patients um, who may not be otherwise immunosuppressive, though that's probably arguable. Um, and what we find is that this particular organism can be transmitted from person to person or from fomite to person um, via contact with contaminated liquids, including uh, things like intravenous uh, solutions, um, 
any kind of mouth rinse or soap solutions. So, for example, um, you, uh, you know, a patient could be colonized with this or be usually contaminated with this in some way. Wash their hands because that's what you are told to do. Um, but the use of uh, soap solutions doesn't necessarily kill it. And so if the, uh, if the patient comes in contact with that soap solution, it could end up um, leading to a nosocomial infection. These organisms are um, oxidase positive, uh, they're modal, um, and they're gram-negative rods. And um, xylus oxidans, for example, is obviously it oxidase, it oxidizes xylose as well as glucose, okay? Um, one of the things that we use uh, uh, that can help us differentiate the chromobacters from each other is the Jordan's tartrate media. Um, this is specifically used uh, to be able to um, test the ability of the organism to utilize tartrate uh, as an organic acid. And you can see that where dendrificans and pichaudi can uh, Fecal alkaligenes faecalis cannot. So the Jordan's tartrate and the nitrate are going to differentiate a chromobacter from alkaligenes, okay? Um, you can see that there's less information about xylose oxidans, uh, and usually that's because the sugars help us identify it right away. Um, treatment uh, of these guys is, um, variable. Um, so you have dentrificans, which is capable of producing uh, a beta-lactamase. Um, a chromobacter xylosaxidans uh, actually possesses natural resistance to all cephalosporins and, and often to uh, the aminoglycosides and astreonum as well. Okay. There also have been reports of ESBLs uh, uh, among the xylosaxidans. Uh, species, um, but that is still uh, pretty rare, okay? Uh, Pichaudii has demonstrated resistance to ampicillin, gentamicin, and some cephalosporin. So you can see they kind of have a very varied um, uh, resistance panel, and so we have to be careful um, that, and, and that resistance panel can also sometimes help us to identify the species. Honestly, uh, for many hospitals, the choice has been made to just call it a chromobacter species and not worry about speciating it um, and get to the sensitivity because um, that's really what the doctor wants anyway. But if you've got this nitrate positive, um, oxidase positive uh, bug, uh, it's, it's something you have to consider uh, as an identification. Uh, the key thing with this group is um, every time you learn uh, these, the one group from, uh, you know, one uh, um, non-fermenter, um, within a few years, the taxonomists will make you crazy by changing its name and moving it into another genus, okay? Uh, just like they did with the Chromobacter and with several of these other um, uh, organisms. So this page contains several organisms that when I learned them, they were called Flavobacterium. Uh, flavobacterium uh, comes from the Latin meaning uh, Flavobacterium, yellow bacillus uh, in Latin. And so these organisms are known for a yellow pigment that they commonly uh, create. Now, it's not a pigment that you necessarily see on the agar, but when you pick it up, pick the organism up on a swab, you can frequently see this, this yellow pigment, okay? So we had, what I learned, I learned about Flavobacterium indolingenes uh, and Flavobacterium meningosepticum. Um, but now it's called Crisiobacterium indolingenes, which by the way, what does Crisio mean? In Greek, it means golden. <laughs> so I guess they didn't want the Latin anymore, so whatever. Um, and it is uh, a gram-negative rod. Um, it's very similar to Flavo because it used to be there, okay? Um, and then we, what used to be Flavo meningosepticum is now Elizabeth Kingia, which is very difficult to say. Um, also, um, a, a potential uh, nosocomial or um, 
opportunistic infection. These organisms are all ubiquitous. They're in the soil, they're in the water, but they're not supposed to be on you. So when we notice them in large amounts, we let the doctor know, okay? Elizabeth Kinga, especially this guy here, has been known to cause neonatal sepsis, uh, neonatal meningitis. So we really have to be vigilant in our neonatal ICUs uh, and our nurseries that we keep them clean and that the water and the water products that can be contaminated uh, are cleaned. These organisms are able to survive chlorinated water. So it's you you're just using, you know, chlorine, that's not, that's not gonna work. So um, again, many, many hospitals have included um, UV um, light over their equipment so that they can um, prevent these nosocomial infections, okay? Uh, these are frequently found as contaminants on hospital equipment. Um, and so we know exactly where the nosocomial infection is coming from. Now, Crisiobacterium, that one's mostly associated with catheter-related uh, infections, including septicemias, um, still pretty much only in compromised patients, okay? Um, again, uh, one of the things, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, Sphingobacterium, again, um, used to be Flavo, but now it's Sphingo, and they moved that because this particular um, group of organisms contains high concentrations of sphingophospholipids um, as the lipid components of their cell membranes. And there's a couple of uh, species, Sphingobacterium uh, multivorum and Sphingobacterium spiritivorum. These names are just crazy. Um, and they've been associated with bacteremia, uh, peritonitis, and respiratory infections all associated with um, nosocom their nosocomial infections, okay? So it's not that these things have the ability to normally break through all your barriers, but when we use contaminated or dirty uh, hospital equipment, not that, that anybody intended it, but it, it manages to gain access to areas where it shouldn't be, and it has a good time, okay? Um, so this is something that we have to definitely consider. Are we using um, are we using the the uh, the right um, disinfecting solutions uh, on our equipment? Okay, not just with patients, but also in the lab. Uh, one of the characteristics about Sphingo that's interesting uh, that helps you identify it. You can see here I have Elizabeth King on a blood and on a McConkie auger. Um, but sphingobacterium can't grow on um, McConkie agar, so that's something that we actually do use to help us identify it. And this page has the um, characteristics that you need to know to identify this group. I'm grouping them together even though they're separate genus because they used to be in the same genus. And so they used to, you know, we used to learn them together. Um, so these are long and thin bacilli, so different from, uh, you know, um, Acinetobacter and all of those, which are short little stubby guys. These are long and thin. Uh, they are non-modal um, and they have this yellow pigment. They are oxidase positive. And also with these ones, you will get a fruity odor. Um, the, well, they will used to be in the fusos. Uh, but these ones do have a fruity odor. Again, you don't stick your nose in it, but when you first open that plate, that's when you'll most likely detect the odor. If you don't detect the odor, that's fine, okay? And then these are the um, biochemicals that you're going to use in order to identify it. You'll, again, you know, here's your motility, um, but you have several things that you'll need to run to be able to differentiate each of these from each other. Uh, does it oxidize mannitol? What's the indole? Uh, gelatin use, uh, urea, all of these things will help you to differentiate. 